everyone, I'm Arlene Dickinson. Thanks for joining me on my podcast. I have been a longtime partner of TELUS because I value the support they provide to both local businesses and entrepreneurs. Recently, TELUS launched Stand With Owners. It's an initiative that's targeted to support Canadian small businesses during COVID-19 because now more than ever, we could all use a bit of help. And that's why TELUS and I have partnered to provide all of my listeners with an exclusive limited time offer. Right now, if you bring your business to TELUS, you can receive 20% off a mobility plan for business and you also get the first three months free. That's right, free. Visit telus.com slash reinvention to redeem this offer. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Reinvention. Today I get to speak with Colin Mockery. You know, who's line Colin Mockery? The comedic genius Colin Mockery? He is such a treat and I can tell you that he made me think hard about what it takes to be able to do improv but also to just live your life in a way that's meaningful and in the moment. Take a listen. All right. So, Colin, thanks for taking the time to speak with me today. It's really a pleasure to see you. Lovely seeing you. And uh, thanks for having me on. I'm very honored. Well, it's, uh, listen, I honored. I feel like, I'm, I mean, I don't feel like I am talking to um, comedy legend, you know, comedy royalty. I, I don't like, I'm not even quite sure what to say. Every time, I remember the first time I saw you in person and I was just, I honestly, I don't get starstruck, but I was so struck by everything about you because when I grew up, um, I mean, we're about the same age, but you were on television long, long, long before I was. I mean, you've, been on, you've had a storied television career. I mean, it's crazy the, the shows you've done, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I remember seeing you and thinking about watching Whose Line Is It Anyway? And I, or Whose Line Is It? They don't say, I guess it's not anyway, it's just Whose Line Is It, Right. Um, and and watching you and Ryan and the whole cast and and just being so as a as a younger younger adult just so enthralled by this notion that you could just on the spot be so funny and so in the moment to be able to just be and say whatever it was you were feeling at that time and it really actually helped me just learn to kind of be it's you know life is about improv right life is about kind of always being ready for whatever comes your way. Absolutely. And we were totally enthralled that we could make a living from this because <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, um, I, up until um, uh, recent events took over, uh, you know, I've been, I've been touring with Brad Sherwood for uh, like 17 years. I'd started another tour with a hypnotist and um, I'm doing this job that didn't exist when I was growing up. And every day I'm just thankful. I'm, well, I'm really thankful for Who's Line because it's certainly uh, gave us all visibility and gave us a chance to do what we love. So I've been really lucky. Talk about, talk, tell me about that. Like, how did you, when you started out, I, I was reading, doing a little bit of reading about you and you, when you were younger, I mean, first of all, you were born in Scotland, mm -hmm. which I didn't. I, um, and how old were you when you came to Canada? Uh, six. Six. And yeah. you, where did you, where did you, where did you come? Uh, well, of course, my, uh, uh, Montreal. Uh, my my parents had friends in Montreal, but for some reason, um, our first place there was in a totally French-speaking um, neighborhood. My family did not speak any word of French, and in fact, just had this very strong Scottish brogue. So there was a lot of miscommunication um, <laughs> early in my life. <laughs> and then, um, I guess around 1970, we moved to uh, Edmonton. And then my mother just despised it there. Nothing, uh, if any Edmontonians are um, listening. I personally love Edmonton. I've been there a lot um, in the last couple of years with various festivals and always have a great time. Um, and then we ended up in Vancouver. And that's where I mostly grew up. And so, and, and you're, but now you're in Toronto, correct? I was, got trapped here by a woman. So it, oh, <laughs> well, we'll talk about that woman later because she's also uh, comedy royalty. Uh, she's also an amazing, amazing human. Um, but so you, you come as a young child to Canada. You have this Scottish kind of background and history. And then you, you are in and you're in a, and you're in a French community, which I can't even imagine what that would have been like. So you're speaking Scottish brogue in, in uh, French Canada. 
No, that accent was quickly beaten out of me by Canadian toughs. <laughs> <laughs> don't speak like that. We don't speak like that here. Oh. So, and, and, then, and then you, what were you wanting to be what, as you were kind of growing up and going through those, that period of time? I mean, the 70s were an interesting time to grow up. That was when I was kind of also growing up and young adults. So, well, I know for me, that period of my life in the early 70s, and I, was, I got married in 1974 for the first time. Um, and <laughs> that, that's, that's not even a punchline, is it? I know, I- <laughs> <laughs> so sadly, the truth. Um, and but but in those times, it was just so different. You know, like I, I think careers and 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 opportunity was you were more trying to find a job that was going to take you for the next twenty five years of your life, right? You were going to try and find that career that was was more predictable and solid and safe. So tell me what you went through as you were going. Well, of course, up. once you say that, I immediately uh, decided to become a marine biologist because. <laughs> I figured the oceans would be around for a while. And I, I don't think um, it was because, I, th- I think it was because I liked the show Flipper. Um, growing up, I watched, there is? <laughs> I, I think that was, that was the impetus because I thought dolphins were just these amazing creatures. And it, um, also, I think part of it was um, I was very shy, very quiet. And my family was a loud family. So I think being underwater <laughs> was like getting away from it all and just being with nature and hopefully dolphins. Um, so that was my plan. I was in sciences, uh, you know, studying hard, uh, you know, in, in Vancouver also. Uh, I, I would think that would be a great place to be a marine biologist, being right by the ocean. Um, but because I was so shy, a friend of mine dared me to try out for the school play, uh, a rollicking um, musical western called The Death and Life of Sneaky Fitch, <laughs> uh, which was only, I think, performed in 1970s in schools. And um, I got the part, and when I got my first laugh, it was immediately bye-bye uh, marine biology. I, re- I still remember that moment. And is that every time I talk about it, I still get that um, thing up the back of my spine. I just remember sort of realizing oh, this, uh, this is changing my life, this, this moment. I don't know what this is, but I want this all the time now. So uh, I immediately got into, uh, switched from sciences to the arts and then just plugged along till. Um, things worked out for me when I was 40. How, how, how old were you when that happened, when that moment happened? That, I was 16. So you're 16. I, I mean, I, I, I think about that a lot because I talk, I'm sure you do. I talk to a lot of youth, you know, in that kind of 16 to 20 year old range who are trying to figure out what they want to do. And they're, and they're so determined that they have to know what they want to do. But here you were trying to be a marine biologist and then you just had this life altering moment. But you also had the courage to, change from science to art like that like where, where's your what, what did your family think of that yeah um my i think my mother was worried uh <laughs> because she um and uh, to this day still doesn't quite get um showbiz as really who does it really a lot of it doesn't make sense but she w- wanted me to um uh, even when I started out acting, she would send me matchbook covers that said on the back, so you can be a lawyer with some phone number to call. <laughs> and I kept thinking, <laughs> first of all, I, I don't think a matchbook should tell me what my career choice should be. Uh, my dad was more, you do what you love and you keep doing that. So uh, even though, again, he didn't quite understand, he was totally supportive and um, he said, as long as it makes you happy and you're not hurting anyone, do it. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think it takes a certain type of, I mean, I, I, when you describe that moment of, you know, that down your spine, that feeling of this is what I want to do with my life. I think that's a rare thing. And, and many people never get to experience that, that moment of clarity about what it is that their purpose is in life, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I've been so incredibly fortunate throughout my life, uh, you know, not only with what I ended up doing, but also in relationships, well, most relationships. Um, but, yeah, it, I, I can't imagine 
um, not ever getting that feeling. I mean, I've had so many friends who go into, who went into jobs because they just, they wanted to make money. It wasn't something they were passionate about, but either because of their parents or because that was their mindset. I want to make a lot of money, then retire by the time I'm 40 and then just live the good life. And, uh, you know, it never worked. Even if you do get that money, it doesn't always work out the way you, you want it to. I've been, you know, what, there were times destitute, totally destitute, but still I knew it was what I wanted to do. And also I had no other skills. So I really had to focus on this and make this work because I really wanted it. And I often, a lot of young people always come up, especially uh, there's young improvisers who say, well, how do, how do you become a famous improviser? And I, I, I you know, Again, I was fortunate that a show came along that took the one skill I had and allowed me to make a living from it. All I can say is if you love doing it, just keep doing it. Um, you can't go into this business thinking, I want to be famous. You have to do it because you have to do it. Yeah, I, that purpose, that passion, that kind of drive. I think you can't you can't invent or reinvent yourself in any way if you're not prepared to do the hard work. And that's a lesson that I keep saying over and over and over to people that you know there is that that old saying of there is no overnight successes. Well, there aren't. You know, it it, it takes a lifetime of devotion to become um, good at your craft. I I believe. And when I think about you know what you just said, I I, I think it's you were an introvert. It sounds like, are you still an introvert? Do you still consider yourself a shy and introverted or? Yes. I mean, I've had to get better with the success of Who's Line and what I do, but it's, um, Deb has always called the guy on Who's Line, my wife Deb has always called the guy on Who's Line the other because it is so unlike me in real life. That person who is shameless and will do anything for a laugh <laughs> is not this guy. Um, so I'm still introverted, but I have a persona, the Colin Mockery persona that I can use when um, being interviewed or talking to fans that I, I guess I kind of hide behind. So you, but you can pull it up whenever you want to. Like, so you say you hide behind it. So it, it, that's where you get your courage from is the, is the actual humor and the, the comedic kind of relief. Is that where you are able to step out and be able to be in front of people when you're shy? I, I think I try, believe me, I've tried to uh, figure it out because people say, well, how can you do, if you're shy, how can you go on a uh, stage with no show? And <laughs> But I think the reason is I've built this world where I'm working with people that I totally trust and who I know have my back. I know what my skill set is and I know I can do this. So I'm in this totally safe world, which I don't have um, outside of that world because of all the other um, elements. So I feel really confident walking on stage in front of 2000 people with no show is the most confident I feel in my life. That's, I so relate to that in a different way, um, but I relate to that because I am very, like I am, my idea of heaven is, you know, one thing about the pandemic, you know, this kind of being by yourself, <laughs> kind of, uh, hunkering down, I haven't minded it for the most part because I just genuinely like, I, I'm very much a loner. And very much, uh, you know, don't like the stage, don't like these big, like, I don't like this, sorry, the big rooms, you know, the stage meaning going into big parties and having to chit chat with people. I'm terrible at it. Mm -hmm. But put me on a stage in front of 2000 people without a script, and I can stand up and talk and, you know, and do what I want to do. And I feel completely, again, like you just described, safe and able to express myself. And I will say things in front of 2000 people that I probably would never say in front of one person. Yeah. It's odd, isn't it? It's really odd, right? Why is that? Always, why can't I transfer that? Why can't I get that outside of my, my comfort area, which is, to most people, would be a nightmare area to, to work in? I wonder what it is. I wonder what that is that makes us feel safe in front of crowds but not safe in front of one individual or two individuals where we're having a, you know, a very similar conversation because it is a, I'm, I'm finding through doing this podcast that I'm learning more and more about 
intimate conversations with people and, and, and how meaningful they can be. I mean, they can be so, you know, I, I, I can, you can learn so much from them, but I find them really hard because I think you're, I feel more vulnerable in them. Yeah. Well, I, maybe that's the, th- when people come to see you in your show or your talk, they all have um, this idea of who you are and what you're going to do. So in some ways, there's no pressure because you, you are that person for that moment. You are the person who is giving the speech, who is talking. I am the person who has been on the show. They know what they're to expect. When you're outside of that, then it's like, well, now I have to be the Mimi. And now I have to connect with them in a different way. Um, well, we both need therapy. Yeah, maybe, maybe. And I, I'd be okay with that. I don't, I, I'd be curious what they'd say. When you, when you think about your career then, so did you just like, did you, so you go to school, you love, you go to the arts, you, how did you then get into whose line? Like, was it just a first edition? You got the show, you got the, the part, like, tell me about your career path. What's that been like? It, you know, it's uh, like any, uh, young person in the arts, there's the period of struggle. So um, my last year of theater school, I saw a demonstration of this thing called theater sports, which had been developed by an English man in Calgary. And it was improv in a sports sort of setting. There were two teams, there was a referee who would give challenges, the teams would do the challenge, then it gets scored. And even though it was, that was the format, it didn't really matter who won or who lost. It was, it was the improv. And I immediately fell in love with it and uh, started to do it. And Vancouver started their th- own theater sports league. And um, this lovely uh, theater owner, Ray Michael, uh, said, well, you can have our theater after our main show. So like 11 o'clock at night, it was right beside a McDonald's. So we would <laughs> run into uh, the McDonald's and say, hey, come see our show. We're, we're starting this new thing called theater sports. And they'd say, what is it? What's the show? And we said, well, we don't know. You have to yell things at us and then we'll make it up. And within a year, it was the major theater event in Vancouver. There were lineups around the um, block. We started doing improvised um, plays. We did an improvised Hamlet um, improvised musicals, and it just became this big thing. And then after, um, at this point, uh, Ryan, I, I'd met Ryan Stiles, who um, at that point was a stand-up, but we started doing improv together and re- really hit it off personally and uh, professionally. And then Expo happened, and Ryan was hired by Second City. So he moved out to Toronto to do that. I moved out with my then girlfriend at that point, and ended up um, auditioning for Second City um, in front of the woman who would later become my wife. Oh, (laughs) okay. Yeah, she hired me for Second City. So um, so I plugged along there, and then um, Dan Patterson and Mark Levison, who created Who's Line, um, were every year would come out looking for North American improvisers because improv was still a fairly new art in England. So they saw our Second City show, loved it, had us audition the next morning at eight in the morning, which is a horrible time for any artist who has been doing a show. Uh, But because we all had worked together as a cast very well, uh, we did that thing you're supposed to do in improv where you support each other. So nobody stood out. So none of us got hired. The next year, uh, Deb had uh, written a show that got picked up. We moved down to L.A. They came through again. I auditioned with people I didn't know. And it was like, hey, screw you. Look at me. And I got it from that. So there's an important lesson for you youngsters out there. (laughs) Never think about the other performers. Um, So I I got it. uh, Flew over to England to do, because at that point it was a British show did um, one episode that did not go well. Let's say I sucked. Uh, So that didn't go well. And so I thought, oh, well, that's it. It's just this little show in Britain. It doesn't matter. The next year, they were shooting in New York. And uh, Ryan was at the show 
was part of the show at that point. And he said, you know, give Colin another chance. So they did. And uh, because I was in New York, I was much more relaxed than I was in Britain. They put me with Ryan, who I'd worked with uh, for a long time. And then it just kept building until I became a, a regular. Um, oh. But that's, you said two things that really fascinated me. Like, well, one, I'm just curious about when you, when you, you moved there with your girlfriend and you auditioned in front of your now wife, did you know when you auditioned in front of your now wife that she was going to be your now wife? <laughs> no, no, it was a, a little, um, I auditioned and, and the auditions are horrible. They're like, you know, three or four hours. You start off with 40 people, then it willow it down to like six. And then at the end, Deb came up and said, well, it was between you and the cute guy, but <laughs> <laughs> you're getting it. And I thought, oh, okay. I, and then it wasn't until, uh, I guess it was like two or three months later that we started um, becoming really good friends. <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was totally her because I, uh, this will shock you, Arlene. I was always a little backward in that area. I uh, uh, was always uh, constantly amazed that women um, found me attractive. So uh, thank God she, uh, she worked that out. Yes. Well, you, you are, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're very attractive. And, and I think it's your, it's your energy that makes you even all that much more attractive. So I think she's, she saw this, this star power, but she also saw the human. Um, you also said something that really, I, I think is an important point to circle back on, which is this, you know, let don't you know you have to stand out don't be the person letting the other person win isn't it human nature when you're in a crowd and there's a, a group of people to almost feel a little bit intimidated by what other people are doing and feel like you're not good enough so you're going to let them be and you see their star power and you see their ability to own the stage or do whatever and then you kind of shrink back and you're saying the exact opposite that that is exactly when you have to step forward and kind of own the room that's so hard to do Colin like many people can't do that it, it, it is hard and especially uh it's it's hard in improv because it is supposed to be an ensemble thing where yes you know people of course are going to stand out um but you're also you you're trying to work together uh, towards a common goal which is to make a a, a good scene so uh if you have someone just kind of showboating and taking over the scene it it really diminishes it uh, in a way. So it's finding, a lot of times I get asked to uh, go to improv uh, theaters um, uh, around the country, uh, you know, for fundraisers and stuff. And I'll work with the local impro improvisers, which is number one, great for me because it sort of gets me back to my improv roots and reminds me of the rules of listening to people. But I also have to point out I know my name is on the poster, but I'm just one of you guys. I can't be um, the star of every scene. I, of, of course, I'll be the star of some scenes, but I'm also going to support other people as you're supposed to do so that all of us can be a star at some point. And it, it's, it's hard to do. It's really hard to do to know when to stand back and when to go forward without... Um, hurting people's feelings or uh, destroying a scene or squashing someone. And it's so, especially when you're a young improviser, it's so easy to get squashed and then just sort of retreat and uh, never get comfortable with it again. It's a really great point on leadership that you just made there, because I, I think to, at some point it's so easy to be the person that can suck the air out of the room. You're always the person who's in front. You're always the person leading. You're always the person who's the star. And to allow your team or your people around you to also have their moment is, is critical, and it's going to be very difficult to do, um, and, and especially if you want to win. As, you know, whether you're pitching something or doing a show or whether you, you want to be able to perform your very best, you know sometimes when you have to take over because you're feeling like you're losing the crowd or you're losing the opportunity. And it's very difficult to do, but it's really important because great leadership does let people, other people become the star once in a while. Yeah. I, that's one of the things I love about Who's Line is that any on any given night, anyone can be the star. And everybody, everyone on that show has their devoted fan group, um, which I, I, I think is great because... And because everyone is an accomplished improviser, but we all have different skills within that, which uh, appeal to different segments of the population. So 
I, I always thought, yeah, it's great that we're all kind of equally loved. Well, I'm loved a little more because I'm more humble. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's great to be part of such a, a group where it does, there is that give and take of, uh, okay, you be the leader in this scene. And, um, and that's one of the things I loved about working with Ryan. Um, I mean, he was a stand-up, and sometimes stand-ups don't make the best improvisers because they're used to owning the stage for themselves. Right. But what I loved working with Ryan is he was just as happy if he set you up for a joke and you got the right punchline. <laughs> he was always tickled by that, and uh, that's why I think he's like one of the, the best improvisers around. It's interesting on on um, Dragons and I sit with you know other other people on our cast and. I know what you're talking about because there are moments where you just have to, you have to realize that there's a moment happening and you can't step on that moment. You have to let that moment unfold and whoever's having that moment, whichever one of us is in the you know, middle of something that's actually a point to be made or a meaningful idea or you know, um, a, a relationship that's happening with the pitcher, you have to sit back and you have to really be aware. And, and that's difficult to do because that means being in the moment. And many people, I think, lose. And, and improv has got to be all that. It's, it's got what's happening right now is what's happening that matters. And if I don't pay attention to it, if I don't really listen to it, I can't react to it. Whether that's to be quiet, whether that's to step up, whether that's to own the room, whether that's to let somebody else own the room. And I think we we struggle as humans with that because – we're either thinking about the mistakes we've made in the past or we're thinking about what we're going to do in the future, but we're not thinking about what we're hap- what's happening right in the moment. Yeah. It's, uh, when people uh, say, how, how can you improvise? It's so difficult. And it, it really isn't. It's just you have to do things we're not comfortable doing in real life. You have to listen to people. You have to accept their ideas. And you have to uh, build them up. And, and basically, that's it. And uh, for young improvisers, the, the hardest thing for them to learn is to say yes to people because they, they come in with their own preconceived ideas of how everything is going to happen. And if that person, the person they're playing opposite, doesn't go that way, then they try to force their idea, then it ends up the scene doesn't work. And uh, Deb and I actually, about 10 years ago, decided to make, <laughs> decide, you know, we're improvisers. Why don't we actually use those rules? in our life and maybe start saying yes to things that take us a little outside our comfort zone and see where it takes us. And, uh, you know, try not to make uh, assumptions when you're first meeting someone and just be open to everything and actually listen. And it, you know, we, to varying uh, degrees of success, but it really has um, taken us to these incredible places, got us to meet some wonderful people, led us in these uh, amazing experiences. So, you know, we constantly try to do it. And, you know, because we're people, we sometimes forget that. But um, it really has helped our lives. So you, you literally, you guys sat down as a couple and said, let's apply this in our day-to-day lives and let's see if it actually helps us be better humans. Is that, is yeah. that what that took you? Yeah. I, the very first test we got was uh, we were asked by World Vision to go to the Congo. And I think previously we would have gone, oh, the Congo, I don't know. But we said, you know what? We said we would do this. So we went, and it was one of the most, uh, I think, important trips we've ever taken as a couple. Uh, it was right after Christmas in North America. So we went from that to the uh, jungles in the Congo, going uh, into these villages in the middle of nowhere, uh, incredible poverty. But there was this... Uh, I don't know, the spark and this joy in these people. I remember seeing Deb leading all these kids uh, by the lake in the hokey pokey. Um, We were doing uh, commercials for um, getting sponsorship for some of the kids there. And uh, just listening to their stories were so heartbreaking. But it was just this amazing uh, trip where we met these amazing people. And I think... Like even a couple of months earlier, we would have found a way to say no to that because it was something we were not uh, totally comfortable with. And we've actually found out getting outside of our comfort zone has taken us to uh, a lot of wondrous places. And so we try to do that, you know, within reason. I'm not going to jump out of a plane uh, into a shark-filled lagoon or something, but 
I, I will do things that take me out of my comfort zone because I find a lot of magic happens there. Yeah, what a, again, what an important point to make because I, I totally agree with you. I find that when I do things that are the things I fear the most is, and especially being, again, back to vulnerability, especially when I find I allow myself to be more vulnerable in front of other people and less the strong person, but more the person who admits their weaknesses. I mean, I, I've spoken a lot in my case about the anxiety that I suffer. I suffer from anxiety and, and it's, um, and you know, the more I speak about it, the more control I feel I have over it. It's, it's exactly the opposite of what you fear is going to happen happens, right? You, you go, wow, there's something here that if I just admit this to myself, I can, I can reshape myself and deal with things a little more effectively. Absolutely. Do you, so you guys, um, so you, you, you do that now in, in your day-to-day life. I just, let me look back a little bit to the improv for a sec, because I bet you people are curious about this, because I sure was. I've done a few comedy shows. Um, I, I love comedy. I love it. I, I wish I was a comedian. I'm, I'm so not, but I do love it. And I, I, I think I have a sense of humor. Um, but I always was surprised when I did the shows, how much of it was actually more scripted than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Is improv ever scripted? Uh, no. Um, but, well, I'm gonna, I mean, just from my experience, I'm going to say no. And mostly it's because that's the way we like it. Uh, also, when you're improvising, you know, there's sometimes you're improvising and you get a suggestion you've had before. And you think, oh, maybe I'll okay, use that bit from something I improvised. Book. And it just, see, it just seems, um, it, it seems written. I think mostly because we're really bad actors. <laughs> that's, why we, <laughs> <laughs> we, that's why we don't use scripts. Uh, and for me, the excitement is going out there and not knowing what's going to happen. That's the, uh, that's the daredevil in us. Um, again, not going to jump out of a plane, but perfectly happy to stand in front of an audience and um, ask them for something to do a scene on and have it work or not work. I mean, both uh, certainly make you feel more alive than anything else in the world. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because as, so, so I remember when I think back to the show, to that show, I, you've done, how many shows have you done? Like, first of all, is it dozens? Like, you've done a lot. Uh, yeah, my first show was in 1990. And, uh, yeah, the 30th, we did the 30th anniversary of the British show a couple of years ago. Did four shows at Royal Albert Hall, which was amazing. Um, yeah, we've done hundreds of shows. So we did, I did eight years with the British one, six years with the Drew Carey one, and we're in our seventh year with Aisha. So, oh, my God, that's a lot of hoedowns. <laughs> Well, I, I love the hold on, but you know, one of the things I love um, the most was when you guys used to take the hats and the scarves and the boas out of the trunk and then just, you know, improvise like mm. a scene. That was one of my favorite, favorite skits that you would do together. And you and Ryan, I honestly, I, I have so many memories, as I said, of laughing with tears running down my cheek of the things that you would say. And you could always tell when you guys were also having fun. When you were also laughing at each other, right? Yeah. It, it, I mean, it really is a good group. We all, um, I actually was just doing something last night with uh, Greg Proops and I, uh, Aisha um, on Zoom. Um, it really is a, a good group, and we've all become really good friends throughout the show. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really proud of the show. Uh, like, there's sometimes I feel like, uh, I'm a certain generation's uh, Mr. Dress Up <laughs> because so many people come up and say, I grew up watching you. I watched you since I was three years old. And I love the fact that families, a lot of families would watch our show together because it was uh, at a time where it was rare where one show would appeal to the entire family. And also, there are times when you think, oh, well, this is my show. I walk like a chicken and <laughs> I put on a hat and pretend I'm someone else. And then someone will go up, come up and say, you know, um, I recently lost a parent or I was going through a divorce. And for that half hour, there was nothing but just laughs. And I want to thank you for that. And um, it's, it was a, a nice little ego thing to think, oh, yeah, I guess it does at times 
do something more than just make people laugh. I know during the pandemic, people were uh, contacting me and saying, we've just been binge watching Who's Line. So it's, it's nice to be part of, uh, I guess, an essential service. It is. I think humor is so important right now and, and humanity is so important right now. And, you know, you talk about families and I, I don't, if it's okay with you, I wouldn't, I'd like to just talk about your family for a minute because sure. I think you've been really um, incredibly supportive and, and so um, vocal, I guess is the only word I can think of, but it's supportive and just, and unafraid to address um, transgender issues. I mean, I, um, your, your, your daughter, Kinley, Mm-hmm. As, um, was uh, born Luke, um, transgender, has gone through reconstructive surgery apparently just recently, yep. right? Um, yep. how, is, how is she doing? She is uh, amazing. Um, you know, uh, she was supposed to have her surgery late in August and then the pandemic hit and they canceled everything. And then Women's College called and said, we're slowly opening, we're doing like one a week and because we don't deal with COVID, uh, we're totally safe. So it ended up being two months before even what the original date was. And I think, uh, although excited, she was also terrified. Yeah. Uh, because even though this was something she wanted, it is a major thing that she started thinking, am I going to, I've never dealt with this kind of pain before. Uh, will I be, will I regress, blah, blah, blah. And she came through it beautifully. Uh, Right now, she's like two weeks ahead of what her scheduled recovery should be. She didn't use any painkillers. Wow. uh, And she's just, uh, she's just been amazing. And she's happy. She's look, she's been uh, video dating. I need to video date. Tell her to send me some tips. I need some tips. (laughs) Kelly, Uh, call me. I need help. (laughs) So, uh, uh, yeah, and she's just, uh, she's just great. And she's happy. She's very happy. And it's, um, it's just nice to see. It's nice to see, um, well, I mean, we've been on this incredible journey with her from the time she was born to, uh, she's going to be 30 this year. And it's always been the three of us. We've always been really close. And she's always been totally open with everything. Um, throughout her her life and I mean a lot of it I have to um, really thank and appreciate Deb for this because when Whose Line started for me and I was traveling a lot Deb said you know what I'm going to take a step back from working right now and just concentrate on our child and uh, because of that they have an incredible bond and um, yeah, Deb was an incredible mother and really, you know, fostered communication and all the great things you need to be a great person. So I, I'm very proud of both of them. Again, I really lucked out on that um, audition. You really did. Well, and, and I want to say that I, I, I'm going to just have to edit this, um, Colin, because I said it wrong. Um, um, she had sex reassignment surgery. So um, is, the right, is the right terminology correct? Not yeah. Reconstructive surgery. So, um, reconstructive surgery is what I would do to my nose, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> Your nose is lovely. It's fine. No, it's not. I need help. I need help. Um, we, won't, we won't take all this out. But can I just ask that question again? So, yeah. um, Colin, your, your daughter, Kinley, just had sex um, reassignment surgery seven weeks ago. And how is she doing? She's doing great. She has uh, gone beyond all expectations. Her doctors uh, and uh, Thank you, Women's College. It, that was a great team. Um, her surgeon called because we couldn't visit her. We kind of dropped her off at the hospital, went to see her. It was, it was heart-wrenching. It was, I think it was tough for uh, Kinley because she was also nervous about the entire thing. Okay. But their team was amazing. The surgeon called us every day to give us updates and said, you know, I'm, uh, she and I are going to be watching some uh, – you know, movies tonight together. Uh, I can't say enough about them. And uh, Kinley, I think, really surprised herself with how strong she is. She didn't use any painkillers, uh, which was something she was worried about. Um, 
she and like her mother uh, very obsessive with the rules that she had to follow <laughs> she has lists of this is what i do at this time and this time and uh she's been she was a wonderful patient she was full of grace um even during some of the, the days that were not as good as others she was still you know thanking us and um and loving with us and i'm uh, just so proud of her yeah so. and i and i love you know when you when because we're talking about reinvention, I love that she has reinvented herself to who she really is. So she, she didn't reinvent, yeah. but she, she took the opportunity to physically manifest the person she was inside regardless. And I love that. And I think it's brave. And I, and I love how you and Deb have been such advocates for being able to let people express themselves for who they are, not with any judgment or not with any, any sense of, um, of anything other than be who you are and and that's okay i i yeah i mean we we are all i i guess we all have a tendency to judge or but basically we just want the same thing everybody we want to be happy we want to be our best selves we want to find love we want to have a good job people go about it in different ways so and who's to say who's right who's wrong as long as again nobody's getting hurt but to um, I don't know, to um, try to shame pers- people who want to be their actual selves, I've never understood. Because what? why is it your business? How is that affecting you, what someone is doing to be happy? Yeah. It has nothing to do with you. It's, it's so true. And I think, it, it, especially if you just kind of think about what you do for a living, which is being yourself. You know, you're, you're on stage being yourself and you, you need people to accept that whatever that is, whatever you say, however you act is okay. And I think, I mean, you've you become such strong advocates for the LGBTQ community. And um, I, I, I feel it's uh, really important to say, and I, I think, I, I know you have advocacy there that you work on. You also have advocacy for the, um, the comedy actors and that group of people out there and, and the pay levels that they receive and, the, and their reimbursement. And I was reading some of the stats on that around how horrifically underpaid uh, many uh, comedy actors are. It's just, it was shocking to me. What made you take up that? You know, I, I can understand, um, you know, with your daughter that that was a personal you know, mission for you to support and to love and to be able to talk about that. On the other side of the things where you advocate now for equal pay and for better pay for comedy actors, what made you take that up? Why did you have that as a cause? Uh, having grown up and uh, gone through that system, um, it, it's a criminal how it's underpaid. Everybody loves comedy. Um, when... Everybody was shut in. People turned to, you know, comedy specials and the comedy movies. It's such an important thing of our life, but it always seems to be the first thing to sort of be, well, it's just, you know, my, my uncle is funny. It's like, yeah, but being funny <laughs> in the family kitchen with people who love you is different than standing in front of a stage of people who don't know you who have paid money. That's a different skill and it needs to be recognized. And, um, there were, we've uh, actually, there's been a, a petition sent out to, to recognize comedy as an art form. It's, it's not recognized as that, which I, uh, boggles my mind. It's one of the hardest things in the world to do. And there is a definite art to it. And, you know, there's the common misconception that, you know, if you're an actor, you're rich. Or if you're, uh, you know, it's like 1% of the acting profession is, you know, like your Tom Hanks, your Tom Cruises. Everyone, maybe 10% of the acting population makes a living wage, and then everybody else is just struggling. And I think the uh, percentage is even worse for comedians. It's really hard. And, you know, there's so many horror stories of getting taken advantage of. It's a lonely life. You're on the road, you're in clubs, a lot of time with uh, hostile audiences. It's not... Um, you know, it's not all glamour, and it deserves to be uh, get the money um, that is required to to make a living. It's an important part of our society. Humor is very important. It uh, sort of 
sheds light on our society, it points out hypocrisy. It's, it can make you think. Good comedy can make you think, and it can change the world. And that should be recompensed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think it's great that you're bringing it to the attention of people to say, because I was really surprised by the stats I read around how underpaid most um, comedic actors are and it's not right and it does need to be brought to attention and at the end of the show we'll talk about you know any any places people can kind of support petitions or support any of the causes that you have Colin because they're really important and I think you talk about humor being a catalyst in people's lives to change our minds and change our, our frame of minds and, and help us through uh, what what right now is just like a shitty time I mean oh my gosh it's being so hard for people and and I think comedy is the only thing that helps us kind of go you know what we we've got to be able to take a pause and, and look at this and and hopefully make it less um frightening than it is yeah we need that release there's um you know so often even like in you know you know a dangerous situation that ends up well that there's that release of maybe a laugh or a, after a, in the middle of a horrible argument something will strike you as funny and it diffuses um th it's a great release there's nothing um healthier than having a good laugh yeah i've been watching there's a there's a great gal on um i think she's on tiktok and instagram um Oh, I've got to think of her name. Sarah, it'll come oh, to yeah. me. Uh, uh, Sarah starts with a P. Do you remember? This uh, no, the one who's doing the Trump. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hold on. I'm going to pull her name up so we can say it properly. Sarah. Sarah Cooper. Um, Sarah Cooper. Yes. Yeah. So there's this, there's this, in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, Sarah Cooper is a, a, a wonderful comedian who's actually taking a moment to help relieve the, and help us look at the reality, as you said, of what's going on with Trump. And I, I just love that she's got the courage to do those types of things. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Colin, I, I feel like I've taken tons of your time up. Is, is there anything you want to leave people with that you want to say to anybody that um, matters to you that you'd love to talk about before we go? Um, I've been incredibly fortunate throughout my life, and I truly believe in paying that forward um and uh, especially with my my family with